Hi friends, and welcome to the By Faith Podcast. My name is Christine Hoover, and I'm so glad you're here. This season on By Faith, we're talking about the ins and outs of vocational ministry. I am so happy to tell you that today is release day for my brand new book, How to Thrive as a Pastor's Wife. I poured my heart and soul and everything I could think of that God has taught me in my own life as a pastor's wife for over two decades into this book. My prayer is that it will encourage you, help you in very practical ways, and remind you of the ancient truths that God is forever with you as you serve Him where you do. You can pick up a copy of the book wherever books are sold, and I've linked to some of those places in the show notes for you. I am celebrating this week with a few Instagram live chats. Tonight, I'll be on Instagram with my husband talking about marriage and ministry and taking your questions. So come hang out with us at 8 p.m. Eastern Time. My Instagram handle is at ChristineHoover98. Okay, friends, for today's episode, my guest is Lauren Chandler. Lauren is married to Matt, who serves as a lead pastor at the Village Church in Flower Mound, Texas. And Lauren loves to serve inside the church through leading worship and in some other ways that you're going to hear about today. She also serves the global church through writing. She's written a few Bible studies and children's books. Lauren joins me today to talk about zeroing in on our sweet spot in ministry. How do we know what our gifts are and how do we say no to everything else? Lauren shares how comparison and perfectionism have hindered her in the past from serving in her sweet spot. She also shares the unique challenges and blessings of serving as the pastor's wife at a large church. Lauren is so great. You are absolutely going to love her. So here, friends, is my conversation with Lauren Chandler. It's my great privilege to welcome Lauren Chandler to By Faith. Welcome, Lauren. Thanks, Christine. I'm so excited to be with you today. Well, I am too. I feel like we've kind of circled each other over the years and briefly met a long time ago, but I've never gotten to sit down and talk with you. And so I'm really excited to to do that today. Me too. I kind of wish I was interviewing you though, because I feel like you've got lots of experience. (laughs) And so um, that's for another time. (laughs) Well, I do appreciate that you were willing to read and endorse my new book. That really yeah, that meant, was helpful. That really meant so much to me. So thank you for being willing to read that. I mean, it's kind of a long book. It when I so turned it in, I was like, uh, this is really long. I have a lot to say about this. So well, and you had a lot of good stuff to say and really helpful and very just like kind of normalizing some things that I think pastors and planters wives are like, is this normal? I don't know. (laughs) Are we alone in this? And just that, the idea. Yeah, me too. I've been there. You're not alone. It's so encouraging. Well, thanks. Well, let's hear about you. I mean, okay. Probably a lot of people know your name, but I would love for you to introduce yourself. Tell us where you are, your family, anything, anything you want to tell us about you. Yeah. Lauren Chandler. Um, we live in the Dallas area in a suburb, kind of closer to Denton. If you're familiar with the Dallas Fort Worth area, uh, we've been at the village church for, uh, this is our 20th year. Um, it's been, yeah, this, so in December, it'll be 20 years. Um, but so we just celebrated our 19th but we're in our 20th year is what Matt and I are saying. So, cause we're like, we made it. <laughs> so my husband's Matt Chandler. He's, we've been at the village almost 20 years. Like I said, he is a very gifted, uh, speaker, preacher, um, very passionate, very loud, very tall and uses lots of motions <laughs> and motions are <laughs> motions. He is known for um, his hand motions. I do believe. Yeah. Yeah. I think there was a Babylon B or article where he like somehow signaled a plane to land in our <laughs> parking lot. <laughs> anyway, so funny. And, uh, we have our oldest Audrey is 19. She just graduated high school and she's going to go off, uh, and do a little, she's not a lover of school. So she's going to kind of make her own way. She's going to do a little junior college, kind of try to get in the equine rodeo horse world, which she loves, uh, read 16. He's in 10th grade and, um, he's my musician, football player, deep thinker, deep feeler, uh, but loves music and is very athletic. So he's a lot of fun. And then Nora, our third, uh, just a bundle of joy and she's Matt's mini me. She's 
like a lot like him personality wise uh very outgoing a lot of fun she just started playing basketball and that's been really fun to watch except that we've decided that she so she goes to a private christian school and you know in private christian school the plus side is if you haven't played basketball before and you're in seventh grader, no big deal. Come right. on, join the team. Uh-huh. You don't have to, have, but versus like public school, you had to kind of be doing that since you're like four. Right. Um, so anyway, but uh, I will say it sometimes turns and it looks a little bit more like rugby than basketball because <laughs> there's so many jump balls, which I'm so brand new to basketball. I've learned so much. I, I really enjoy watching her play, but it is, it can get pretty physical, uh-huh. <laughs> especially for whatever reason, the girls, because my kids I play know. basketball and the girls do a lot of wrestling. They do. It's like tearing the ball out of each other's right, hands and right. oh, rolling on the ground anyway, <laughs> but it's really fun to watch. Yeah. So that's, those are our three kids. What else? I, I love to lead worship. Um, I've also written Bible studies. I've written a book. I've written a children's book. And then I have another children's book coming out in, um, I think in this, in September, I, I just, I have lots of interest. <laughs> I love, That's I'm like an it. amateur bird watcher. I like to <gasps> work in the yard. Oh, are you a bird watcher? Well, we kind of are bird nerds around here. Yes. Okay. Have you, you have p- app? Well, my husband has a nap with uh-huh. this. It makes the birds calls. Oh yeah. Uh, well, yes, I have an app that does all of it. It can listen to a bird call and identify it. It can play the bird call and it identifies what bird you've seen. Uh huh. So my husband's yeah. kind of, we say it's a little mean, but we go to this <laughs> place near our house where they have birds uh-huh. enclosed and oh, he, yeah. will, he will play. I mean, the birds <gasps> cannot fly. He will play the bird calls and they are like, oh my gosh, what? I mean, they, they like light up and are looking around because it's like a mating call, but they can't, yes, they can't do anything about it. <laughs> okay. Have you, mean. have you played the board game wingspan? No, what's that? Oh my goodness. We're obsessed with it. It's about okay. birds. Okay. <laughs> and so all the cards have like facts about all these different birds and their nests yes. and, and that kind of thing. And you gain points through these different cards. Anyway, we're obsessed with it. It's so much fun. You should check it out because this sounds first. like my kind of game. Yeah. Now I'm, I am super competitive. So I have to determine which games I want to play because, uh, I just have to like, I know my limits now where I'm like, okay, there's some games <laughs> I don't need to play because all it's doing is inciting my flesh. So, <laughs> but that'd be fun because I'd be really good at it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You would, and you would like, I have favorite birds and when I get them, I get excited. So yeah. I love that. Okay. So, yeah. That's, that's, that's a little fun fact about me. Are you yeah. going, are you guys going to celebrate 20 years in any way with the village? I hope so. I don't know what, no one said anything to us about planning that yet, but they might be planning it to surprise us. I don't know. We've got, there's a, a guy that's Uh, rolling off he's retiring so I think we're all focused on celebrating him first and then maybe I don't I really don't know I would hope something but you know anybody listening from the village maybe you could start (laughs) planning a party or something yeah that'd be Um, great because it is something to celebrate because I remember hearing I don't know where I I don't know how I heard this but of where y'all began I mean he he the village didn't just this wasn't a church plant. You came into a church. It was named something else. Yeah. How many people were there? So it was a Highland village first Baptist church. And there were 160, 180 people our first Sunday. And there was like a combination of factors. Matt has been speaking at a kind of a gathering in town. And a lot of the people that went to that gathering didn't necessarily have a church home yet. And so when he, they found out that he had taken a position at a church. I mean, it was like a lot of those people started coming. Okay. And what's so interesting is that a lot of the people uh, that came were young professionals or, you know, college age or just out of college. And they started bringing their parents mm-hmm. and maybe their parents were in churches in the area, but, you know, maybe they were just 
I, it was something about their kids being excited about a church and about Jesus that they're like, well, let's go try this church out too, you know, and go with our kids. And, and so a lot of the growth that we got were these people that had come to the Bible study and then their parents, uh, which was pretty neat to, yeah. to um, grow that way, but it was overwhelming. It was really quick. Um, at some, at one point, Matt was doing six services, two Saturday night, two Sunday morning and two Sunday night. Then we went down to, we still had six services, but we ended up like streaming or recording like the Sunday morning service and playing it Sunday night. And we called that version of Matt flat Matt. <laughs> so <laughs> you would go see flat Matt. Uh, and then we ended up moving to a different building and that, you know, gave us some space, but the Sunday that we were supposed to move in, that was, um, Matt had a grand mal seizure and on Thanksgiving day and, uh, ended up revealing that he had a golf ball sized tumor in his brain that ended up being malignant. Um, he went into surgery like two weeks later to remove it. Um, he started chemo, all that. So all that happened around the time that we were moving into this building, which I didn't know that I knew about yeah. the seizure but I, and yeah. the cancer, but I didn't know about the building. Yes. Yeah, so we were moving. We were so excited to finally just be able to do like two services, you know, and, uh, but we were like, this is just the Lord saying, Hey, this is my church. This is not Matt Chandler's church. This is my church. And it was really humbling and really good. And it felt like a burden lifted of Lord. Yes. You've called Matt to lead this church and you've called me to lead alongside him, but this is your, these are your people. And we're, we're just stewarding, you know, the people you've given us. Um, and, and also it showed us that we had a lot of great, uh, incredible other leaders at our church and pastors, and they were able to step in and not miss a beat. And, um, they prayed for us. They, you know, they were mourning for sure, but like life went on and the village went on while we got to focus on that getting healthy and, um, yeah, they gave him two to three years to live and he went through chemo and it's been, it'll be 13 years in this November that he wow. has been cancer free. Oh, so that's incredible. it's a miracle. Yeah. yeah. It's a miracle. I want to pick your brain about all these things because you just kind of got thrown in the deep end. What you're describing is yeah. like riding a fast moving train at you yeah. step on and suddenly you're going and you're like, yeah. I would imagine you're now like, what just happened? Yeah. What am I doing as the pastor's yeah. wife? And so you, you, that, that fast growth and now a large church, I kind of want to, that's what I want to pick your brain about today. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The first being, you know, you talked earlier about you like to lead worship. I'd love to know if there are other ways that you really enjoy serving at, at the village yeah. and how did you know because I would imagine you have so many opportunities, mm -hmm. so many requests, whatever, just in your church alone. How did you know God was calling you to do what you do? Mm -hmm. Well, yes, I've, I've always served in the worship ministry because music's always been something I've loved and I've always loved singing and leading worship, but <clears throat> I've served, I was trying to think back. I've honestly, it's like, somewhat circumstantial. It's kind of whatever I feel like the Lord has given me energy and grace for. Um, and usually it ends up being an overflow of something personal happening in my life. And then it, it just overflows from that, like my service does. And so like when my kids were little, um, so I was pregnant with our firstborn when we got to the village, I was 22 when I became the pastor's wife and I know it was babies young. having babies, <laughs> babies, having babies. I turned 23, like a month late after I had her. Um, so I was, I was really young. I just was like, uh, and that was great. And the church was great to just let me do what the Lord had gifted me to do and to really focus on our family and raising, you know, having a newborn, a first, our first kid. So there was a lot of grace. I didn't feel any pressure to lead the children's ministry or be serving every weekend or be seen every weekend. I felt like I could just go as a regular member of the village church and serve, but also, 
that knowing at that time and always that having a newborn, that most of my energy was going to be focused on home. So then as my kids got older, I was involved with like getting play groups up and running, you know, at the village. And um, I'm trying to think what else did I do? And then the Lord really, uh, he worked in my heart through Celebrate Recovery. It, we, it was kind of a new ministry at our church. And I, I was in a Bible study with some other ladies uh, whose husbands were on staff and an old, a woman who's like, just a, like a step ahead of us, probably like seven to 10 years older than we are, um, just poured into us, gave us a safe place to just share what was going on in our lives and our hearts. And I was doing, we were going through a Bethmore Bible study and the Lord just like really pricked my heart over something. And it wasn't like what you would normally go to celebrate recovery for. It wasn't an addiction. It wasn't, you know, uh, but it was, it wasn't addiction in, in the chemical sense, but it was an addiction to perfectionism um, and uh, comparison and the fear of man. And uh, so I started, so I started going to celebrate recovery when they opened it. They kind of like did a beta version. They opened it to the rest of the church and it was a turning point in my life. And um, so I just got to be a part of celebrate recovery for a while and then went through the steps and then ended up leading worship there, ended up leading a, um, a steps group, steps recovery group. And then I did I led a, a Thursday night group of women. It was called Life Issues and uh, was like a mentor and did that for a while. It was really fulfilling because it was, it was an overflow of what the Lord had done in me. Mm. Um, and then I stopped serving there actually when Matt got sick because I just, everything was on hold. Yeah. I was like, I'm just pulling it back in. And then I uh, just started kind of, continued to lead worship some, I took a break, but that's probably been the constant is leading worship. And then now as my kids have gotten older, I have a lot more time, a lot more flexibility. You know, they're 19, 16 and 13. I've got two drivers. It's amazing. amazing. It's so helpful. <laughs> yes. I'm actually, I've become a, a deacon of, um, a deacon of leader in leadership development at the village. And that's been real fulfilling. I've loved it. Uh, we, we focus a lot on transformational leadership and, and cultivating transformational leaders, helping plan out kind of a leadership pipeline, because before being developed as a leader was, we were developing leaders, but there was no clear pathway to being developed as a leader. And so um, I got to help develop that with one of our um, pastors and work alongside him and my friend, Rachel Joy. And it's been really fulfilling. And it was one of those things where I think I had just thought, well, I'm just a worship, I'm not just a worship leader, but I'm a worship leader. This is what I do. This is kind of the main way God's using me at the village. Because even though I'd written Bible studies for Lifeway, we have such a great, you know, women's yeah. Bible study program. We have Jen Wilkins. I mean, there, so you know, so I think they're fine. Um, and they also have other like, uh, Jenny, Jenny Ham and um, Elizabeth, Elizabeth Woodson. Woodson. Um, so they are like stacked. And so I didn't feel like that was a place that I was needed, nor even had the energy towards, you know, I helped them coordinate worship for a while just, but for the most part, I'm like, no, that's kind of my thing. I'm doing outside the village, but I, I just thought at the village I'm worship, that's where I'm serving and, you know, supporting that. And then I just had, um, actually two of the other just past executive pastors really start, um, speaking just courage into me about leadership and, um, doing leadership development. I'd gone through kind of their, their beta version of what we would call transform transformational leadership community. And, uh, it just was, uh, it was impactful for me. I just got it. Like it just came natural, like the whole process. And so they were like, okay, we want you to be a part of this and to help walk other women through this. And um, so it's, it's been something that was totally unexpected, but I have really loved it. 
And so I, for anyone listening right now, I just think, I think there might be things you're doing right now that you will continue to do in some shape or form, but don't close your heart off to maybe other ways that God might want to use you to serve the body. And, you know, it might change through seasons, but, um, I, I, it was really unexpected and, but now really fulfilling. Good. I'm so happy for that Mm -hmm. for you. I'd love to go back to what you started talking about with the people pleasing, because I just spoke to another pastor's wife yesterday who said, I know I'm doing too many things, but it's really hard for me to disappoint people. Mm, So could you speak to that? What have you learned about that? Um, I think I have recognized my own limits and that I cannot Uh, be everything to everyone at all times. And I think um, I have uh, just, yeah, I've embraced those limits. Um, I've also, you know, to say yes to one thing means you say no to other things. And so I've just made certain things a priority and tried to protect that. And if I, if I can't have lunch or coffee with you, I'm so sorry. You know, I, I do feel like that is one advantage of being at a large church is because there are a couple of people that will assume, oh yeah, she, she has lunch or coffee with everybody. You know, I can, why not have lunch or coffee with her ass? But for the most part, people are like, gosh, there's so many people in the church. I, why would she have time for me? You know, and it's not like, that I wouldn't care, but it's just, I just, I do appreciate the people that are like, man, there's a lot of people in the church. And uh, sometimes it's a back, there's a back edge to that because there are people that I probably would have loved to have coffee with or known. And they've given me space because they're being thoughtful and considerate. Um, and I'm like, but you're the people I want to have. Exactly. To I, exactly. The people who would give you space are the ones yes. like, no. I know, I know, but we've, um, we've instituted some things in the last year, like Matt and I did a, um, a life plan, uh, through the Patterson center and really how, one of the things that was kind of, they have, you do four helpful lists, like what's right, what's wrong, what's missing, what's confused. And I think what was wrong was that we were having too many one-off dinners with people. And what was missing was like, where if we say no to that, you know, the one-offs, but we still want to know people at our church that maybe we don't naturally like cross paths with. Um, and so we've, we've started kind of implementing something that's, that's meeting that it's, uh, where we are with multiple couples that have been at the church for a while. And it's been really fun getting to know them spending time with them. And it's not, uh, it it doesn't feel like these one-offs where I'm like, well, I'm glad we had that time together. Are we going to, you know, where it feels like such a drop in the bucket and this feels a little bit more effective and deeper. Um, and so, yeah, that's, we've had to just adjust and know, okay, our priority is going to be our home. And then, even like our family relationships, because both of our parents live in town. Then we have like our community, like we've got friends that we do like with and we love. And then we have kind of these places of ministry where there's, there are people that God's just put in our path to, to love and encourage. And it's probably not going to be as intense as home or those, that friend group, but we are intentional with them. And then there's like the, a little bit more of the, the fringes. And so like, if something can sit in there and it works, then fine. But for the most part, we're just going to make these our priorities. And, um, very, it's very rare that I have to say, I just don't, I, I can, I will say, gosh, life is crazy for the next month. If you're willing to just, um, wait, you know, till April or whatever to do this coffee. Great. But for the most part, uh, we try to just attend to those kind of first few groups and then fill in uh, other time with intentional 
you know, coffees or Mm -hmm. lunches or something. Mm -hmm. Does that answer your question? Oh yeah. And I think I love (laughs) you use the word adjusting. I think you said adjusting at some point. Yeah. I think that's a key word because your, your church, your family, nothing stays the same. No, it doesn't. I feel like I'm constantly evaluating and and adjusting constantly. And sometimes Mm -hmm. it can be hard to look back and go, Oh, I really liked that season where I was able to do that thing that I can't do anymore. And I can, I grieve that loss sometimes, but I love that you talked about you and Matt kind of talking that through. I do think it has to be a constant conversation of, okay, where do we need to adjust? Yeah, totally. Because you can just get just drawn away, like a current pulling us into crazy busy. Yep. Yep. And not having deep relationships. So I, I very much appreciate what you said about adjusting. Can you speak to how do you say no? So, you know, I mean, the, <laughs> the thing comes, the request comes and it's usually the one in person. It's like they catch you or whatever. And yeah. I don't want to come across like, I don't, you know, we love people and we want to serve them. That's yeah. the heart, but we also mm-hmm. know what God has called us to do. Mm-hmm. And so sometimes I, that when that tension of, I know pretty quickly, this is the no. Yeah. Yeah. But I don't quite know how to say that. Yeah. Can you walk me through how you approach that? Yeah. I haven't had the places where I've definitely just felt a no have been requests that come from the outside, Okay, you know, that are not within the village church ask that happen within usually I explain like, man, it's just not a good time right now. And usually that, because sometimes it isn't like a complete no, but maybe just a not right now. And so it, I feel like it's normally a not right now inside the church. I haven't had a lot of, Oh no, not happening, you know, or maybe there have been a couple and I just, I, (laughs) make suggestions about other people like, Hey, you should talk to such and such, you know what? Who's great. Has a heart for that. This I have done that Mm -hmm. where I just connect them with someone else who has the time, energy, grace for whatever they're wanting or needing. Um, so I've definitely done that. I don't think of that as a no, because I'm like, no, but I'm connecting them. Yeah. But I guess it is a no. It's just like, not with me. And so I will connect them to someone that I know I'll get permission from that person. Hey, can I send this person to you? Like, this is what uh, they're wanting. And they'll be like, yeah, or gosh, that's not, that's not really where I am right now. And then I find someone else. So I usually can at least give them a step towards someone else and then just kind of be like, done, you know, pass them to someone else. And hopefully they can find what they need, you know? Um, And then if they really do want, if it's just with me, then they, I put it on them to contact whoever that is. And so if it was just, they wanted to meet with me, then I guess I told them, no, (laughs) no, I told them not me, but them. And it's on them to reach out. If they really wanted help with whatever it was, they had to make some kind of effort towards the person I suggested they go to. Mm-hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes total sense. I, <laughs> I like that connecting. I'm wondering if you feel expectation. Cause I think often when we think of Matt Chandler, we think of a dynamic yeah. speaker. Yeah. Do you feel sometimes like people expect that you're going to be just like him or do you feel expectations um, in other ways? Yeah. I think sometimes I, I try to just, uh, put the disclaimer at the beginning. I love my husband and he is an incredible speaker. I'm like, I'm not like him. I, there are other things I enjoy doing. I will speak, but it's not my favorite thing to do. And I'm, I'm not like him. There's oh, there's only one of him and there's only one of me and there's only one of you. So mm-hmm. I'm, I feel, I, I want to give people the disclaimer that I'm not like Matt, but I don't necessarily fairly feel the pressure to be like Matt. Um, So I know I I'm like, I'm me. And if you want to invite me to speak, I, or whatever, I'm, I'm there. Um, And I think part of the message the Lord gives me is 
you be you, you be who God has made you to be. You use your gifts uniquely uh, for his glory. And um, so that's kind of part of what I feel like God's put on my heart to share. That's the message he's given me almost just my entire life. And uh, so that's real easy to push those expectations to the side when I operate from the space of there's only one of me, there's only one of you. And what, what the church needs is you to, to be obedient with the gifts God's given you where you are. And so that fits really well <laughs> when I have to go do something uh, that I might think, oh, they might have expectations of me because of that. And I can go ahead and just either let them down or just adjust their perspective a little bit. Uh That's really good. You seem very secure in that. Like I'm hearing you as you're talking the whole time. It's just, I, you feel confident in who God has made you and sure there might be some things that come, but you're not really letting it get to you. Yeah. I mean, there are, de- there are places where things can get to me. Um, <clears throat> it just, it's rarely about, it, it's more, it's rarely about feeling this expectation that I'm Matt's wife. And a lot of times it's, was I clear when I spoke? Did I make any sense? Was I, I good enough for my expectation? Uh-huh. Not necessarily someone else's on me. Uh-huh. I mean, I feel like I can be my worst critic and then I have to submit that to Lord, you have gifted me. I did the work to prepare you. You get the glory and you get it's, it's your fruit, you know, that I, mm-hmm. I, I am really trusting that you will bring about. And um, so if I'm insecure, it's in those ways. It, when I'm insecure, not if, when I'm insecure, <laughs> it's those ways. Like, did I make sense? Was I clear? Yeah. And did I live up to my own expectations for myself or, or am I okay to just be like, okay, God, I prepared, I did what you asked me to do in the way that's just me. And I trust you with the results. Mm -hmm. You just said the theme kind of of your life even is this message of you be who you are, who God made you be. Yeah. Why are you so passionate about that? And, and what Mm -hmm. would you say to the women listening who are primarily pastor's wives? I would say, um, about the time I was, I guess, probably junior high, like before junior high, I was just a real, I think a a pretty carefree kid. I was real imaginative, um, loved music for like purely because it was, I loved it, you know? And then I feel like in junior high, I started kind of looking to the right and to the left and comparing myself to other girls in particular. And I started to see, "Mm, I don't like how God made me. Mm -hmm. I like how he made them. Mm -hmm. And so let me pattern my, my sound, my look, my life uh, after them. And actually doing the life plan, I got to look back over my life and there were just different people that I would look towards as a model of this is what I want to be instead of being content being me. And so, and a lot of times it was people that had very similar gifts. Mm -hmm. Um, And so, especially when it comes to music um, or worship leading or writing or anything like that, I would look to them and instead of just letting it overflow naturally from my own heart, I would craft it to be like them, if that makes sense and compare myself to them, even to the point I wanted to sound exactly like them. And so that has been the biggest scheme of the enemy in my life to not look to God for my identity and purpose and gifting and calling and to thank God for how he's gifted me uniquely. It's been to look beside me, see how he's given gifts to other people and coveting what they've been given and being what they've been given. And, um, and really living a very dissatisfied life. Mm. And so it actually kind of going through recovery and just walking in my gifts and, and learning to embrace the gifts God's given me that are unique to me, um, 
It has, I mean, it's been a journey, but it's been so much more fulfilling. And what's funny is he started to even change my desires where I thought this is what I wanted. And I thought this is what I wanted life to look like for me. But then as I relinquished that plan for my life and accepted God's plan for my life, I realized, oh, actually that would be exhausting. I wouldn't want that. Mm -hmm. Instead, like what God's given me is actually really satisfying and and deeply satisfying and not, not like um, everything's great, but I, it's just this deep joy and satisfaction that God's given me by just saying, just surrendering. Okay, God, I surrender my plan, what I think is best for me and my gifts. And I accept whatever you have. Mm -hmm. And so it's, yeah. So that's been just a consistent thing in my life. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like going back to who you were before you realized there were people around. Totally. It's like the, the little girl, Lauren, who yes. was just being who God made you to be of, yeah. of loving music. And it's like the sincere, sincere living out of who God made us to be. That's actually something yes. I've, I've been thinking about lately is I, somebody kind of asked me some questions that made me think, oh, well, who was I before I started uh, yes. pr- performing? Mine's performance yes. and pr- productivity. Yeah. And, and who I am, who, when I look, think back to who I was before that, it's things that just bring so much joy to my heart, but I don't yeah. give my time to that because I'm over here trying to do these things that will earn me approval from people. Yep. Yep. Totally. So it sounds like and you're I- further along in the process. <laughs> and I love that. It's something I'm very passionate about. And I even think about you know, Jesus welcoming the little children and saying, you know, that we are to be like them to enter the kingdom. And I think it's, yes, that, that childlike faith and, um, looking to him and trusting him. But I I think too, it's that the, the childlikeness of not operating worried about what everybody's, how everybody's perceiving you, but it's just this pure overflow of, of joy or, um, you know, excitement or, you know, whatever, whatever that is. I think there's something there when Jesus talks about, you know, being like a child, uh, yeah. in that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So do you have any, maybe what for somebody who's listening and they're like, oh my goodness, I can yeah. so resonate with what Lauren is saying. Yeah. What, what do you do when you realize that kind of yeah. life is in some ways gotten out of control because you're doing this thing that is not working for you and it's not pleasing God. It's about pleasing others or whatever. Is there something specific that you would say that they could do first? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, two resources, I would say, um, my friend, Rachel joy with Sparrow collective has these things, uh, I guess it's a booklet now called identity, identity sheets. And I think they're real helpful to just kind of go back, think about your story, think about the things you just loved as a kid. Um, So she, I think that's really helpful. I love the identity sheets. Our church also, uh, my uh, Matt preached a sermon called Unearthed. And we, we talked, he talked a little bit about that. And we had some uh, resources online. I don't know exactly where to find them right now, but they were kind of similar, just worksheets where you just start writing down. They ask you questions that kind of get you thinking and you write down your responses and uh, kind of takes you back to that place of, okay, what, what did God put in you before you, you realized, you know, people were, like you said, people were watching. Um, So those are two places. The identity sheets are, you can, I think you can order them online. It's a really pretty book. I think it's pretty affordable. If you want to take a step further, we do an identity course, um, two to three times a year in our, in our hometown in Louisville. Uh, so we've had ladies come from all over to do it, Mm. but, uh, it's, it's great. Um, and that would be Sparrow collective is where you would find that information. Yeah. I love, I love that. I'll link to all that in the show notes for, for people who are listening. And I just think this gets me so excited to talk about, because I just want pastor's wives 
especially to walk in their giftings. And Mm -hmm. because other women watch that and go, Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. I can do that too. I don't have to live according to how everyone thinks I should do this. I can live according to God says I am. That's right. That's right. Has made me to be. Yeah. So thank you for sharing all that. I'd love to talk about the large church perspective and just know, Mm -hmm. uh, what are some things that are challenging about being a pastor's wife at a large church that we might not necessarily know looking from the outside? Yeah. I think probably what's like uniquely challenging and maybe it's not all large church pastors, but I think having a husband who is so um, public Mm -hmm. and can be misrepresented a lot, can be misquoted a lot. Things can be taken out of context that the heart of it was totally misunderstood. You know, I think that has been the hardest part for me is having my husband, you know, just bashed publicly for something he actually didn't really say, you know, I think that's the hardest part. Cause you're like, okay, we're going to be persecuted by the world for what we say, you know, that's true about Christ, but then to be bashed even by other believers about something he didn't even really say and just misrepresented him. That's been hard. So I try to like, not, sometimes it just comes across, you know, my feed or whatever, but for the most part, I don't go looking for it and people don't send it to me. And I'm really grateful. In fact, a lot of times Matt won't know something was said until he starts getting all these texts. It's like, Hey man, I just want you to know, I love you. I'm praying for you. And we're like, Oh no, <laughs> oh, no. Somebody what's, said what's been said. So that's like a unique challenge. That's just hard. That's hard. As far as just the thing is, I'm like, I don't know if this is a large church problem or just a pastor's wife problem, but I think people asking me for information that I'm like, I don't know. You think I know things? I don't know things. <laughs> you I know. know? And I I'm think like, that's an all pastors. Watch. It's like, are you the, yes. you're the church directory, yes. you're the church calendar? I mean, yes. it's like, I don't I'm like, know. I don't know. Check the website. Yeah. I don't know. Or I'm, I can be like, here, talk to this person. They should know something. So, uh, that, and I'm trying to think of anything else. Um, honestly, it's all really positive. Like we went to dinner for Valentine's day, this little, little sushi restaurant in the suburbs. It wasn't fancy at all. And this sweet family sitting at a booth next to us. And they, um, they don't go to our church, but they listen them out on YouTube. They go to another church in the area, which I'm like, yay. I'm so glad you're committed to a church body. Um, and they just were like, thank us for our ministry. And anyway, so that just is neat. So I feel like there are more positives than negatives. Well, tell us about large... it. Yeah. Tell us, about the, tell us about the, the positive. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Just seeing people will just say something and they'll say, thank you, mm-hmm. you know, just out and about, you know, around town. And I feel really loved. Our people are pray for us. Like we have a lot of people just pray for us and I'll get text messages and they are super supportive and, um, you know, they have questions there. There's the negative part where they have questions, but we have avenues where we have member meeting where people can ask those questions, or we have our Facebook page where there are a lot of people that ask questions (laughs) and there's sometimes I'm like, Oh my gosh, (laughs) but, uh, we have people to answer those there. But I, like, I am friends with a lot of the other pastor's wives. Um, I don't feel pressure to like meet with every pastor's wife or staff wife. Um, because I feel like they've got good community within their groups. Yeah. So those are, those are the positives. I feel like Mm -hmm. of large church ministry, I've never felt super lonely because I've had friends that go to the village. Um, whose husbands are on staff, who they, they they're on staff, you know? And I think because we have a culture of no one's perfect. This is about Jesus. This is his church. And we're going to disappoint one another. We are going to hurt one another. 
but praise God, there's repentance and forgiveness. And so, um, I think we've, I think, I mean, as far as I know, it's a pretty great place to work and be a part of. And so I've, I've never felt the only time I felt really lonely has been when the outside has judged my husband or our church. I think also a blessing, which you may not realize is the outward blessing of yeah. a large church has resources. Yeah. And they true. use those resources to create resources for people yeah. outside of the church. So I have been the recipient of that blessing to get to do yeah. online, like during COVID when yeah. the church made it um, accessible to everyone, the teaching yeah. and resources that to me, ha- that's been a blessing to me. And I think that's something that, you know, a smaller church, they can't necessarily do, but they kind of are downwind of yeah. of the what's going on there. So I, I just want to say thank you to, to yeah. you guys for making that stuff available. Well, just in closing, mm-hmm. I would love you at the very beginning, you mentioned you, that you're a writer too. And so mm-hmm. I'd love to hear about your latest, I guess we could just, you know, talk about the latest one. Well, yeah, and then the, the Bible study coming out, but the yeah. latest one was the Bible study with us in the wilderness. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So that was a Bible study that I wrote on the book of numbers, which it's kind of crazy. You know, it's not like, Hey, you know what book of the Bible I want to study in numbers. Um, but the Lord really, he, like I said, he kind of, he, uh, stirred my heart towards it. I was really fascinated. I'm a very curious person. So I like to research and dig a little deeper. And so when Lifeway approached me about, you know, Hey, do you have any ideas about another Bible study? Cause I'd already done one with them called steadfast love. Um, I said, what do you think of numbers? And they're like, well, I don't know. <laughs> so I started working on that and it, it was really, um, intriguing and it, it brought depth and texture to the rest of scripture studying numbers. Mm. Um, because you'll see, uh, the wilderness generation is referred mm. to in the new Testament and yeah. in other parts of the old Testament, kind of like, do not be like them. Right. <laughs> so it's like learning lessons from somebody else who blew it, you know? And, yeah. um, but, but also seeing God's, uh, person like persevering with him and, oh, and his yeah. steadfast love towards them that he did not, he didn't, he didn't give up on them. He didn't remove his presence from among them, even when they rebelled. Mm -hmm. Um, and he still, even though it was a whole different generation, he still got them into the promised land. He still did what he said he was going to do. And so it, and, and he did it with them. He did not leave them alone. Mm -hmm. And I think that was, there's, there's so much to learn from in numbers of what not to do and what (laughs) to do a lot of warning, but a lot of comfort, like, Hey, we're not the first ones to go through this. We're not the first ones to have to endure, um, being plucked out of what's normal. I mean, what's interesting is I wrote that book. I wrote that study before COVID and it came out, uh, I think, right. I guess it was 2021, but I like, I started working on it August of 2019 and finished in March of 2020. And then like our whole world went through a wilderness season. And so, I thought that was really interesting, the Lord's timing personally in that. Um, And so it's, I hope it's an encouragement that that we're not the first ones to go through wilderness seasons as a, as a, like an entire community of humanity. Right. Yes. Um, But uh, also just our personal wildernesses that Uh we go through where transitions in life or having to leave something you know, that was comfortable, but not what God has for us and having to trust him in this transition period and that the Lord works in that transition period, like, um, and, and, and that that transition period is like, it's meaningful. It's not a waste of time. Like he is doing something, uh, in the wilderness. And that also means they didn't stay in the wilderness. He had a plan for, the promised land and, and how, you know, we can see that laid over our spiritual lives that one day we kind of, we're living in a wilderness right now. It's not all it's going to be. We're looking to the promised land of new heavens, new earth, like resurrection it's coming. But then we also have, uh, just 
personal places in our life where a mm-hmm. transition in the wilderness. And then this, this new thing that the Lord wants to do like ministry or season of life. So I think it's really applicable for anyone. I mean, it's the word of God. It's, it's showing us who he is and showing us something about ourselves. And it's always a word, a good word in season. And yeah, so sounds really uh, good. But yeah. Yeah. Tell, tell me then, about the new children's book. I will real quick. So I wrote a song called Praise Him um, a couple years ago. We recorded it and released it through the Village Church Worship. Um, and basically it's just like, you know, praising the Lord through every like part of our day or kind of every season of life. So like as the day begins, when the day is just full of hope and promise and you're so excited about what's coming to the part of your day when you're like, okay, going to work you know, I've worked hard and sometimes I have fruit of my labor and sometimes I don't, Mm -hmm. um, but I'm going to praise him in the midst of that. It's the praise him at the end of the day, you know, when the shadows dance at night, you know, praise him that he's with us, like that he holds us, he knows us. And so that's basically what the, the uh, book is, It's kind of following this little girl that looks like, like my, my Nora, my, Aww. third born she uh-huh. kind of looks like her um kind of going through a day like the beginning of the day when it's fun and wonderful and then you know when you know it's just kind of tired and slow and then mm-hmm. at night and anyway it's it's a fun book um the artist that worked on it um her name's Michelle and she did a great job and I just like approved all the layouts and I'm super Yay! excited to hold it in my hand soon Okay. Well, I'll, I'll link to all these things and your other children's book, which makes me cry when I read it. Um, Is it the goodbye to goodbyes? Goodbye to goodbyes. Goodbye to goodbyes. Oh, so good. So thank you, Lauren, for joining me today and giving me your, your insights. I just loved getting to know you and hearing all about what's going on there with you. So thank you. Yeah. Thanks for having me, Christina. It was so good to connect with just a kindred spirit. And I'm just really grateful for you. Thanks so much for listening to By Faith. You can head over to my website, howtothriveasapastorswife.com to find out more about my new book, the discussion guides that I've written to go along with the book and lots of other resources just for you. Join me next week as I share a conversation my husband and I had with Ben and Lindley Mandrell on the Glass House podcast. You may recall that the Mandrells were on By Faith a few episodes back. In next week's episode, they turn the microphone on us and we talk about emotional health as a pastor and a pastor's wife. Until then, friends, have a great week and keep walking forward by faith.